G'day mate, Forty here. So is identity, is that just something that you can decide on your own? Or does that also come to you, right, from other people, right? You I, can I, decide on... I, I wager that it's also something that uh, we get from other people. It's not just something that we arbitrarily get to decide on our own. And I think the most talked about story in the United States today is that video of that man just beating up on that female boxer, right? He's got uh, male chromosomes, XY chromosomes, but the US Olympic Committee still regards him as as eligible to beat up on, on a woman who's uh, fighting him. And it, just incredible outrage uh, over, over that story right now. It's not like... Uh, something you see that very often i mean I, being on the right you're just not particularly ready for the right to start winning at the culture wars but it seems like over the past three four years for the first time in my memory we, we're consistently seeing the right win on culture wars and let, let's go back to this topic of identity so remember the liberal perspective on life is that you can choose your own identity Right? You can choose to be male or female. You can choose to be black or white, uh, Latino, Asian. Right? I'm 1 16th Chinese. All right? I could choose to be Chinese American. And through the power of your own brain, you can decide your path in life. You can decide your identity in life. You can decide what's right and wrong all on your own. You can rec recognize and create a particular path for meaning. You develop your own hero system. All right, it all comes back to you. It's autonomous individuals deciding through their own rational faculties who they are and who they want to be, as opposed to the traditional perspective, the conservative perspective, the tribalist perspective, the nationalist perspective, that reason, morality, right and wrong, the, the path to meaning, and your identity, they all exist outside of you. Your obligations, they exist outside of you. And it is up to you whether or not you want to live up to your obligations. So the liberal left mantra is follow your bliss. The traditional perspective on life is do your duty. Why do you do your duty? Because meaning, purpose, everything that is heroic, the standards for that all lie outside of you as a traditionalist, as a nationalist, as a tribalist, as a conservative, as a fundamental member of a particular religion all right god religion morality purpose meaning standards they all exist outside of you and it's your obligation to live up to them where's my yarmulke it's right there and for for liberals all right meaning purpose and identity is something they can just each individual can decide on his own individualism liberalism is a highly individualist uh, perspective so if kamala harris or barack obama say they're black then you treat them as black, right? Because the individual gets to decide these things for himself. When I look at Barack Obama, when I look at Kamala Harris, I don't think of them as black. And I suppose under enough uh, social bombardment, I, I will learn to watch my words in public. But when it's just me and the images flickering on my screen, they don't seem black to me. They don't look black to me. I'm fine if they identify as, as black. I am not fine if a man chooses to identify as a woman. So the liberal elite leftist perspective is if a man decides to identify as a woman, then you have to treat him as a woman. Every prominent Democrat believes that trans women, meaning men, biological men who decide to identify as women, every major Democrat, including Josh Shapiro, that amazing centrist governor in Pennsylvania, believes that trans women are women. How well does that hold up after you see that battering that that poor female boxer took from a man at the Olympics earlier today? Just incredible levels of outrage that, that I see all over the internet. It gives me hope that, uh, that all is not lost. All right, there, there's a lot of uh, decency still with, with people. And uh, I like what uh, real Donald Trump has put on his Truth Social, that uh, I would not allow men to participate in women's sports. Right. Uh, Matt Walsh says it's worth taking a moment 
to appreciate just how thoroughly we've won on the trans issue. Five years ago, most people were terrified to vocally object to any of this madness. Trans activists were getting their way everywhere and in every area of society. Today, the voices objecting is significantly louder than those supporting it. Laws have been passed in dozens of states outlawing child mutilation and mandating sex segregation in sports. Right? I think this is a good thing. Democrats, Democrat politicians are embarrassed to talk about trans issues at all. Corporations are suddenly shy about waving the trans flag. Medical organizations are finally starting to admit that transitioning children is a bad idea. Anyone who claims trans women are women is guaranteed to get dogpiled online and mocked. The trans agenda has lost battle after battle. Trans activists are a punchline. They are ridiculed and they are not respected. Conservatives have never flipped the script on a cultural issue this quickly and completely. I think that's a great point. Because you don't, in reality, you don't get to decide your identity all on your own, right? Male versus female, first of all, is a matter of sex. It's not a matter of gender. Society decides gender. Male versus female is overwhelmingly a matter of chromosomes. You cannot change your sex. All you can do is mutilate yourself. So you can try to put on whatever identity you want. All right? You can be a man and pretend to be a, a woman. But you're going to have a heck of a time if society does not support you. Right, I converted to Orthodox Judaism. If all the Orthodox Jews I encountered said, I don't count you as Jewish, you're not Jewish to me, I would be unable to keep up with my narrative because from the realist perspective, not just the conservative, traditional, tribal, nationalist perspective, but from a realist perspective, your identity does not belong to you only. Your identity, like your reputation, belongs in the minds of other people, right? You would not be able to perpetuate the idea that you're a man who has transformed into a woman if nobody else supports that narrative, right? You have to have support for your, for your narratives or they drop away. The women taking competence for granted or are they willing to trade competence for DEI depends on the, the woman. The more traditional the woman, the more likely she is to not be down with the diversity, equity, inclusion agenda. So whatever your, your narrative is, if uh, you think you're Jewish, but no one in the Jewish community supports that identity, you're going to have a heck of a time keeping it up. Because we all have to have support for our narratives, for our identities, and for our reputation. Right? My reputation does not belong to me. My reputation exists in your head and your head in your head, in your head, and also in part to me. I think the number one goal in my life over the past four years or so has been to strengthen and develop my own reputation with myself. So that is very important, your own reputation with yourself, what's uh, popularly called self-esteem. That's incredibly important. It gives you unbelievable amounts of, of strength and perseverance and, and bravery and clarity if you have a good reputation with yourself, you can be an authentic person who, who moves through life in, in an effective way, All right? If you have a good reputation with yourself. But you also have to build a reputation with others. If you think you are a terrific worker, but you're getting no support for that at work, right? you're not going to be able to keep up this self-reputation you have that you're a great worker. If you think you're an amazing lover, but no no member of the opposite sex who's ever been with you thinks the same thing, right? You're not going to be able to keep up with, with that uh, perspective, right? We, we all need support for our identity, for our reputation, and for our narratives, our most important narratives. We have to have support for, from other people or they're just going to fall to the side. Right, let's uh, check in for hostage. a quick bit from the... Uh... Raymond Biden made a surprise public appearance today. Yay. Yes, and, and naturally, Laura, back to form, he battled the teleprompter to announce the return of hostages from Russia before taking his own hostage. All the cases of hostages being wrongfully detained, which were inherently, well, we inherited them from the, private, the prior administration, the 13th birthday. Oh, Miriam, Miriam, where are you? Come here. 
You all know we have a tradition in the Biden family. We sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Miriam. Happy birthday to you. Remember, no serious guys till you're 30. Good Lord. And remember, no presidential runs after 80, Laura. <laughs> that, that was the other message Shield. he forgot to mention oh. there. You know, so uh, just thinking for four years, the Democrats and, and the news media hid Kamala Harris's, hid Joe Biden's infirmity. All right. This is a man who's frequently having senile moments. And that was largely hidden from the American public, denied by the mainstream media and by our elites and by the Democrats. Now they're hiding Kamala Harris's infirmity from us. Right? Kamala Harris's infirmity is insecurity. She is so insecure that she can only perform well when she is scripted. Right? She has not taken questions since she has risen to be the Democrats' presumptive nominee for president of the United States. She hasn't had a news conference. She hasn't had an interview. She hasn't gone off script. All right. She has an infirmity that she's terribly insecure. And she is unable to think on the fly effectively. She's unable to take responsibility for her own mistakes. She's unable to maintain staff because she treats people below her terribly. She is a terrible manager. And she she just looks ridiculous when anything goes off script, which it inevitably will as a president of the United States. So just thinking the Democrats hid Joe Biden's infirmity for three and a half years, and now they've hidden Kamala Harris's infirmity of breathtaking levels of insecurity for 10 days. And there's a good chance they'll be have to hide it for another 90 days until the election. Right. I, I would not be surprised if Kamala Harris dodged any aggressive questioning between now and Election Day. And so the Democrats, the news media will probably do everything they can to promote her and to protect her. But eventually it will come out how insecure this woman is, how ill-equipped she is to be president of the United States. And we'll have another horror show like we have right now where we've got a president essentially missing we, we don't even know who's operating the country now because Joe Biden consistently seems so out of it. All right, Steve Saylor has a, a great column. How dare Donald Trump doubt Kamala? Those of inferior identities like Trump should never question their superiors like Kamala. So in the liberal left perspective, every individual gets to choose his own identity, his own path to meaning, his, his own purpose in life. But some identities are sacred and others are not. And so the essence of wokeism is that certain identities, certain groups, such as blacks and trans, do not get to be publicly criticized. They are exempt from criticism. So let's get a quick burst here. Um, and apparently um, even Don Lemon appeared at a Black Men for Harris event. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to be in an independent space where I don't have to worry about the corporate overlords now, where I can stand up for democracy, where I can say who I'm supporting. The worst things that I hear about Kamala Harris comes from white men, straight white men. Oh, well, after hearing your angle, Laura, I guess that makes you a straight <laughs> white man. I mean, what is he talking about? Look, I was surprised to see Don Lemon supporting Kamala Harris. After all, she is 59 years old, way past her prime in his estimation. Remember. Nikki Haley isn't in her prime. Sorry. When a woman is considered to be in her prime in her 20s and 30s and maybe 40s. Prime for what? Uh, it depends. I mean, it's just like prime. If you look it up, it'll say, if you, look, if you Google when is a woman in her prime, it'll say 20s, 30s, and 40s. Wow. Red pilled. Oh. Red pilled Don Lemon. All right. Uh, great Steve Saylor blog post. News article, New York Times. Trump remarks on Harris evoke a haunting and unsettling history. White America has long sought to define racial categories and who can belong to them. What group has not sought to define who gets to belong to them? But what group has not tried to categorize and define the world around it? Why should white people be exempt from this universal human tendency? I can't imagine any group 
not wanting to define who gets to belong to them and not wanting to categorize the wider world around them. But to the New York Times, this is a haunting and unsettling matter that white people are like every other people in the world, right? They, they get to decide who belongs to them and they get to categorize the wider world. Since when? Seriously, did white people get asked their opinion about the Biden administration's creation of a whole new racial category for the 2030 census called Middle Eastern and North African? Did I miss it when Jared Taylor from American Renaissance was invited on all the news shows to talk about whether this flight from white maneuver by the Democrats is good for the whites? Or when South Asians engaged in flight from white and got themselves reclassified from white Caucasian on the 1970 census to Asian on the 1980 census and thus eligible for affirmative action for cheap loans from the... Small Business Administration for Minority Business Development and Affirmative Action in Government Contracting. I don't recall anyone asking the opinion of white people at all. Same for the creation of the ethnicity category on the 1970 census, making Hispanics into Schrodinger's whites eligible for racial affirmative action, but without having to admit that they aren't totally of 100% blue-blooded conquistador ancestry. Was the National Association for the Advancement of White People invited to testify at congressional hearings on these proposals? Then we have a, another news report. The audience of black journalists was prepared for a combative exchange well before Donald Trump took the stage Wednesday for an interview at their annual gathering in Chicago. Yet when Mr. Trump, minutes in, began questioning Vice President Kamala Harris's racial identity, there was an instant ripple of reaction, a low rumble that grew into a roar of disapproval. I didn't know that she was black until a number of years ago when she happened to turn black and now she wants to be known as black. So I don't know, is she Indian or is she black? Mr. Trump said of Harris, whose mother was Indian American and whose father is black. Back to Steve Saylor's column. Right, California political legend Willie Brown says that in the mid-1990s, he introduced his mistress Kamala Harris to Donald Trump on a flight they took on Trump's jet. Right, Kamala Harris got her start in politics as Willie Brown's mistress. So he probably learns, Trump learns that her name is Kamala and thinks, okay, she's Indian and turned her into the pantsuit messiah. The Harris sugar high was the media's excuse to bury the biggest story of the election, Trump dodging an assassin's bullet. But yesterday, everything changed. The talk of the town again was Donald Trump, who knows better than anybody that if you want to change a narrative, you create a little controversy. 45 RSVP'd to the Black Journalist Convention and played the race card. Do you believe that Vice President Kamala Harris is only on the ticket because she is a black woman? Well, I can say, no, I think it's maybe a little bit different. She was always of Indian heritage, and she was only promoting Indian heritage. I didn't know she was black until a number of years ago when she happened to turn black, and now she wants to be known as black. So I don't know, is she Indian or is she black? She is always but identified you know as a black woman. I respect she went to a either black one. College. I respect either one, but she obviously doesn't because she was Indian all the way, and then all of a sudden she made a turn, and she went, she became a black person. Just to be clear, sir, do and you I believe think, that I she is I think somebody should look into that, too, when you ask a continue in a very hostile, nasty tone. It's a direct question, sir. Do you believe that Vice President Kamala Harris is a DEI hire, as I, some Republicans I really don't have know. said? I mean, I really don't know. Could be, could be. Last night, we said we had no idea how this was going to play. But the dust is starting to settle, and we're picking up a few clues. The media barely covered Trump's comments today. If these comments were supposed to be devastating to the Trump campaign, the media would be playing it every hour. If this was so explosive, why didn't Kamala capitalize on it? She put out a bland paper statement last night, but never brought it up again. They haven't cut an ad. Her surrogates aren't going wall to wall. A Democrat doesn't want to talk about race and play the victim and call Trump racist? That's strange. I wonder why Kamala is avoiding this. Does it have something to do with white dudes for Harris? And why isn't Kamala talking about this egregious attack on DEI? Maybe the black community sees Kamala different than we think. I don't know. Maybe this issue of Kamala's race isn't as potent as we think. And that's a good thing, because this shouldn't be about race. And that's exactly how Trump, whether he even knew what he was doing or not, shifted the debate. Everybody's now talking about what Trump needs to do to win. And what he touched on in his reference to Kamala's mixed race, she uses this side sometimes, the other side the other time for political opportunity, gets to the heart of Kamala Harris. 
she's fake. And there's nothing wrong with people with mixed backgrounds identifying in different ways at different times. It's natural. But politicians are phony. And Kamala is a career politician who goes where the wind blows and changes positions day to day, changes accents. She does what's easy in the moment so she can't get pinned down. Everybody knows people like Kamala Harris. She's the kind of girl who's nice to your face, talks behind your back. She's someone who calls you a racist and then joins your ticket. Whatever Trump says, he'll say it to your face. Whoever you are, no matter what you look like, that's real. He may not have sound like a used car salesman, which most politicians do. See, what a lot of people fail to realize is the reason why MAGA supports Trump is because we like the fact that he's not presidential. We like the fact that he's real. And that's what we appreciate. We need authenticity in this White House. This is why Hillary lost. Voters didn't like her because she was phony. WikiLeaks revealed that Hillary had two positions on an issue, a public position and a private position. Same thing with Kamala, except she doesn't even have a position. She literally just said she wants to get rid of your guns, your health care, oil drilling, and ICE. And three months before the election, her campaign puts out a statement that says, nah, she doesn't believe in any of that. What? The first female president is going to be a woman with no principles and no policies? I don't know, guys. Her California sponsor, Willie Brown, is advising Kamala Harris that she ought to embrace her hazy ideological categorization because if she keeps people continually guessing, then she can adjust the interpretation of your guess every time she sees you. How fake is Kamala? She goes by Mamala, but behind closed doors, she makes her interns cry. She won't let them look her in the eye. She says she's tough on crime as a prosecutor, but crime exploded in California. She bailed out BLM rioters. She just cut a plea deal with the 9-11 mastermind. Kamala says she's just one of the girls. But when she ran for Senate, she treated her campaign fund like a personal checking account to fund a life of luxury. She just campaigned, remember, on democracy. Now it's freedom is the slogan. But she fired you for not getting vaxxed. She censored your speech. She's trying to put her opponent in prison. What kind of brave girl boss hides from the mainstream media? She hasn't done an interview in a month. A lot's happened in a month. Trump's doing interviews with CNN, black journalists, libertarians, and they're hiding Harris, who suddenly went from the most unpopular VP in history to a cultural phenomenon. All right. Why are they hiding Kamala Harris? Why were they hiding Joe Biden for three and a half years? Because both suffer from disabling disabilities. All right. Joe Biden frequently lapses into senility and Kamala Harris has crippling insecurity. I read all the campaign books about the 2020 election. I read through a biography of Kamala Harris. I read uh, the main news articles about her. And there's a consistent theme wherever she goes, wherever she builds a staff, the staff very quickly turn against her because she does not do her homework. She is relatively low in conscientiousness, and therefore she constantly gets into embarrassing scrapes. And when she does get embarrassed, she then blames her staff. She's unable to take responsibility because she feels so insecure. And that's why she freezes, and that's why she does all the weird hand motions and the, the nervous cackles because she is deeply insecure and is unable to simply be present with what's going on and, and react like a normal person. On. Who doesn't talk to the media? I'm not buying it. You don't hide from journalists who want you to win. She's afraid. They're protecting her. She's not a leader. All this hype online for Harris? We found Democrats paying people $150 cash a post to make Harris look cool. How does Harris paying for clout make you better off? People see through it. Tell me what appeals to you about Trump. Uh, his business acumen. Wow, I'm just thinking, how, how much would the Democrats have to pay me to write posts making Kamala look cool? Little more than 150. Man, when Donald Trump was president, uh, we were all doing a lot better financially. He's always been a business icon. So why wouldn't we want that business icon to be president? 
And he had this to say about Harris. I think she hasn't done anything worth mentioning. What would you have wanted to see Vice President Harris accomplish that she has not? I would have liked her to kind of bring a calm to the border. The border crisis has gotten out of hand. In a weird roundabout way, Trump's Kamala ain't black comments are forcing him to bring the campaign back around to issues, to substance, to records. It's what the country wants. Maybe he planted a few seeds with the fake race remark, but people are now curious. Who is Kamala? Not so much about who her mom and dad are. We know her mom's Indian, her dad's Jamaican, and she grew up in Canada and has presented herself in different ways to different audiences, which is fine. But she's never fought for you. She's only fought for herself. And that's fake. The contrast could not be more stark. On the one hand, you have a radical left puppet candidate who is fake, fake, fake. And on the other hand, you have a president who will fight, fight, fight for America. Former Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy's here. Kevin McCarthy, when you saw that... Okay, let's get back to this great Steve Saylor uh, blog post today on uh, New York Times and, and the media getting outraged at Donald Trump's remarks yesterday. So, talked about Willie Brown. That's how Kamala, Kamala Harris got her start in politics as his mistress. She was 29. He was 60. So back to the mainstream journalism. The moment was shocking. Not shocking for me, I suspect it was not shocking for you, but it was shocking for those with a particular hero system, all right, that of the conventional liberal left morality. But for those who have followed Mr. Trump's divisive language, it was hardly surprising. I don't see why it's particularly divisive. The former president has a history of using race to pick groups of Americans against one another. Oh, unlike the affirmative action crowd, right? unlike the left, unlike liberals, they, they never use race to pick groups of Americans against one another. The only thing that holds the liberal left Democratic Party coalition together is hatred of, of whites. Right? That's the only thing that gays and Muslims and Latinos and Chinese and Koreans and the various components of the Democratic coalition have in common. Right? The only thing that unites them is fear and negative feelings towards the white majority. So... Former president has a history of using race to pick groups of Americans against one another, amplifying a strain of racial politics that has risen as a generation of black politicians has ascended. In contrast, notes, Dennis, uh, notes Steve Saylor to the New York Times, which never writes about how Karens manifest white privilege. So it's time for a racial reckoning against white supremacy. The audacity of Mr. Trump, a white man, questioning how much a black woman truly belongs to black America was particularly incendiary. Why is it particularly incendiary? It is normal, natural, and healthy to figure out is someone one of us or not? And then if they're not one of us, how would you categorize them? Every people in the world tries to figure out who is one of us, and then how would we categorize those who are not of us? How much of a threat are our groups? So why is it that white people should be exempt from this universal human reaction to life? Is this person one of us? If they're not one of us, how dangerous are they to us? What category do they belong in? And it evoked an ugly history in this country in which white Americans often declared the racial categories that define citizens. Or does not every majority uh, right, create the categories for its particular country? Ms. Harris has embraced her dual racial identities, right? We all have dual identities. Your, your husbands, your, your wives, your, your workers, your bosses, your Christian, Jewish, male, female, Los Angelino, a resident of Montreal, right? We, we all have dual identities, but we're going to have a heck of a time maintaining any identity if we get no support from it, for it from other people. Right? Identity, like your reputation, is not just something you can unilaterally stake out and demand that other people support you on your identity. Right? You have to have some significant social support for your claims of identity, or you're just going to run out of strength and courage to keep affirming an identity that nobody else affirms. So Steve Saylor says, 
Kamala may seem exotic at first, half Tamil Brahmin, half Jamaican mulatto middle class, but in truth, she's just a basic old sorority sister. And uh, in 2019, Donald Trump Jr. shared a social media post from an alt-right personality that falsely claimed Ms. Harris was not black enough to be discussing the plight of black Americans during a primary debate. Well, plenty of blacks did not consider Barack Obama black or black enough. That's why he lost his first election. And plenty of African Americans do not consider Kamala Harris an African American because she's not African American, right? Her father was mulatto. Her father would pass for white in Jamaica, right? So her father was white in Jamaica and considered black in the United States. So in 2004, we have this long New York Times news article on the debate over who deserves affirmative action, right? Do people from Jamaica deserve affirmative action? Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro is getting blown up. Shapiro is accused of covering up sexual harassment in his office. And now the National Women's Defense League is urging Harris not to pick him. One of Shapiro's closest advisors was hit with a sexual harassment allegation. Then the governor's office paid a woman $300,000 to make it go away. Did Shapiro pay hush money to win an election? Because we were told that's a big no-no. Could this derail Kamala's VP process? We have no idea. She was planning on holding her first rally with her VP in Philly, Shapiro State, on Tuesday. Was this a dirty Democrat leak by another VP contender? Probably. We'll let you know how it shakes out. The new Olympic sport, men beating up women. Yeah, that's the the number one story on social media today. So, yeah, back to this great Steve Saylor article. So, yeah, there used to be a serious discussion. Why should reparations or affirmative action go to uh, non-American blacks, all right? It should not be reserved for the descendants of of slaves, right? Uh, Perhaps the majority, perhaps two-thirds of Harvard's quote-unquote black undergraduates are not African-American, all right? They're from the West Indies or their children are biracial couples, all right? You can say on your census, even if you're only 116th black or 116th Asian, you can still claim black or Asian on your identity. But shortly after this 2004 article, Harvard Law School graduate Barack Obama, half white and half Kenyan, with no ancestors who are American slaves, emerged as the great black hope of the Democratic Party. So this controversy was driven from the mainstream media to not confuse the Democrats' return to the White House in 2008. Like many of Mr. Trump's more provocative statements back to the latest New York Times article, the comments conveyed several unsettling ideas at once, all of them somewhat open to interpretation. So Kamala Harris's father split from her mother at age five. She was overwhelmingly raised by her mother. She was overwhelmingly raised in Indian culture, not black culture, right? So Dr. Donald Harris, a communist Marxist economist, got tenure at Stanford University. He comes from Jamaica's mulatto middle class, and they are not called black in Jamaica. Right? They are called white in Jamaica. Now, Americans have a one-drop rule, generally speaking, for lumping people into either black or white, and so Americans don't necessarily understand Caribbean and Latin American gradients, which go back to Spanish times. So on Kamala Harris's birth certificate, her father entered his race as Jamaican, which is probably a sensible way around the problem of Americans lacking a vocabulary to describe mulattoes like himself. So the point of this New York Times news article is that Kamala Harris is a woman, black, Asian, and most importantly, a Democrat. So she has far more Pokemon point privileges than an inferior, like the male white Republican Donald Trump, who should never dare to ask any questions about his social superiors. If you want to get a good reading on Kamala Harris, there's a good book by Peter Schweitzer, Profiles in Corruption, Abuse of Power, by America's progressive elite. It came out in 2020, got a long chapter on Kamala Harris. Begins, uh, President Barack Obama stood in front of an array of well-heeled donors in a private home in super-rich Atherton, California. He'd just been re-elected five months earlier. He was touting his White House accomplishments. And then he praised California Attorney General Kamala Harris, who was also in the room. He praised her dedication and brilliance and added she also happens to be by far the best-looking attorney general in the country. So, 
Kamala and Obama have a long history, right? Harris first supported Obama when he was running for the Senate in Illinois back in 2004, and that they were constantly fundraising for each other. And Harris is widely admired in progressive circles as the female Obama, because she does come across when she's got a script as smooth, polished, and confident. She's worked hard to cultivate a celebrity mystique while fiercely guarding her privacy. The rising star in the Democratic Party has a taste for expensive things like Mano, Manolo Blahnik shoes and Chanel handbags. She paints herself as a gritty lawyer who's climbing the greasy pole by her own strength and determination. She positions herself as smart on crime, which is the title of a book that she published. The reality of her rise to prominence is far more complicated, right? She got into politics as Willie Brown's mistress. She's closely tied to Willie Brown's corrupt political machine. And investigations into her tenure as a prosecutor raised disturbing questions about her use of criminal statutes in a highly selective manner, frequently protecting her friends, financial partners, and supporters. She covers up information concerning major allegations of criminal misconduct, some involving child molestation. Right. Her entry into politics began with a date. In 1994, she met Willie Brown, who was the second most powerful man in California politics as the Speaker of the State Assembly. He was married, but uh, she began dating him. He, he was married in 1958. He remains married today. He was 60 when he began dating Kamala, who was 29. Willie Brown was two years older than her own father. Her affair with Willie Brown was the talk of San Francisco in 1994. She was Willie Brown's mistress for about two years. Kamala's mother defended her daughter's decision. Why shouldn't she have gone out with Willie Brown? He was a player. And what could Willie Brown expect from her in the future? He has not much life left. Willie Brown immediately began pulling levers for Kamala Harris that boosted both her career and put money in her pocket. He rewarded her with appointments to state commissions that paid well and did not require confirmation by the legislature. He put Kamala on the State Unemployment Insurance Appeals Board, later the California Medical Assistance Commission. All right, so she was earning... Uh, $200,000 from those two positions. He gave her a new BMW and he gave her access to his vast network of political supporters, donors, and sponsors. Soon she was publicly arm in arm with Willie Brown in the most elite circles of San Francisco, including the most lavish parties and celebrity galas. Willie Brown ran for mayor of San Francisco and Kamala was regularly by his side. But once he was elected to the mayor, they split up. Apparently, Willie Brown decided to split. Then Kamala Harris started dating another prominent, famous man, television talk show host Montel Williams. Uh, Willie Brown helped her run for district attorney, essentially turned over his machine to her, and she was able to out-reign, out-earn, right? Out-raise funds dramatically more than the incumbent district attorney. And then... She rewarded her supporters by not prosecuting them. And Willie Brown used his pull to get all sorts of city workers to show up to her rallies. Right? Uh, various union workers were told by their bosses to attend campaign events for Kamala Harris. Willie Brown pulled those strings for her. When she took the oath, Of office in January 2004, she decided not to take the oath on the Bible, but on a copy of the Bill of Rights. There were two benedictions, one from a Hindu priest in Sanskrit, the other from an African-American minister. The American National Anthem was played, as well as the National Black Anthem. Then after the swearing-in, there was sitar music and soul, and Indian food was provided. So she hit all the bases. All right, this, this boxing story is the... The number one story on social media today. This week we saw one of the biggest scandals in Olympic history, and nobody's talking about it. Italian boxer Angela Carini, in the blue, squared off against Algerian boxer Emane Khalif. But Khalif is genetically male. Khalif looking to come with the straight punches to the body of Carini. Nice little lead up from Khalif. And the poor girl just gets hit like she's never been hit before. Karina's asking to get her head guard. 
tightened in. Just getting beaten down by this man. Solid straight right hand from and she, she gives up. The Italian woman quit the fight after taking those shots, then fell to her knees and cried. She said Khalif threw harder punches than she's ever felt before. Makes sense. Men have 162 more punching power percentage on average than women. But how did a boxer with male DNA compete against a woman in the Olympics? It's complicated, they say. Khalif, they say, has identified as a woman his whole life. They say there's no indication Khalif is trans. But last year, Khalif was DQ'd from competing in a different... Right, he sure doesn't look like a woman. Different boxing championship after testing positive for high testosterone. But I'm not an expert. Just because he's got male chromosomes, doesn't look remotely female. Who am I to say he doesn't look like a woman? And the male chromosome XY. The Olympics says that's okay. These athletes, uh, boxers, are entirely eligible. They are women on their passport. Uh, they have competed for many years, and I actually think it's not helpful to start stigmatizing people who take part in sport like this. So the Olympics thinks it's fair for a genetic male to punch a woman so hard in the face she quits and cries as long as it says female on her passport. And they're going to let this guy keep beating up women in Paris, and they're just going to hand him a gold medal for it? Next summer, the Olympics in L.A., in California. Kamala's home state. Are they going to allow that? Because today, the new Biden-Harris Title IX rules went into effect, allowing men to change in girls' locker rooms and take scholarships meant for girls. And if you call somebody by the wrong pronoun, it could be a hate crime. Women's sports are being wrecked. Girls are in physical danger. And Kamala needs to answer for this because those are her policies. But reporters won't ask her, and the media won't report it. Donald Trump says when he's president, he's gutting the trans rules. I can tell you one thing. Men will not be playing in women's sports. When you look at this young lady from a different country, what difference does it make? Just look and say, oh, man, what hit me? I just got hit by a horse. And uh, she just, I've never seen that, were two jabs. And she said, I've had enough. Riley Gaines is an Outkick.com host, ambassador for the Independent Women's Forum, and author of Swimming. So you should see what, what happens when you, you've got uh, a, a trans here spiking a volleyball so hard that it leaves a, a female volleyball player paralyzed with brain damage after the trans opponent cackled with delight after knocking her to the ground. So Peyton McNabb was 17, just a cute blonde girl, when a ball spiked by a trans opponent with force struck her in the face, threw her to the ground shut off her consciousness, right? The trans player cackled in delight after sending it to the floor, as did other players in the opposite team. She's left with brain damage and paralysis on her right side. It's difficult for her to walk without, without falling. That's, uh, look at this. Just awful. Right, just just vicious, just deadly. Right, why are you allowing men to participate in, in women's sports? Right, permanently damaged by what's happened. Right, back to Kamala Harris. Right, so as district attorney, she had enormous discretion in which cases to prosecute and which not to, and consistently throughout her tenure, she did not prosecute cases that were aligned with Willie Brown and his machine, right? So she often talks about fighting for those victimized by sex crimes, but uh, she did nothing about sexual abuse of children by priests, right? During her decade and a half tenure as a chief prosecutor, Kamala Harris failed to prosecute one single case of priest abuse, and her office hid vital records on abuses that had occurred despite the protests of victims' groups. So her predecessor of San Francisco DA was aware of and prosecuted numerous Catholic priests on sexual misconduct against children charges, and he'd been building case files for even more prosecutions. 
but Kamala Harris refused to prosecute a single one because the, the church had ties in with Willie Brown's organization. So Kamala Harris consistently refused to prosecute people who were tied into Willie Brown's machine. And she would cover up records of the abuse. And uh, she would claim, we're not interested in selling out our victims to look good in the paper, which was a bold claim coming from Kamala Harris during the 2003 campaign. A woman who was tortured by her boyfriend with a hot iron blasted Kamala Harris for citing her story during a campaign debate. I'm appalled by Kamala Harris referring to my case. Harris is supposedly for victims. She never consulted before using my case. But when it comes to the priest abuse scandal, the opposite was true. Victims groups wanted documents released. Kamala Harris stopped it. They were outraged by her actions. She consistently acted in favor of priest abusers. She consistently acted in favor of abusers who were tied in with Willie Brown's machine. And her actions ran completely contrary to her public image as a fighter for victims, particularly for, for children. So transparency tends to embolden victims of priestly abuse. But uh, Kamala Harris threw in to protect priestly abusers. She was California Attorney General from 2011 to 2017. She was San Francisco District Attorney from 2004 to 2011. Never brought one single documented case forward against an abusive priest. Right. During this time, at least 50 other cities charged priests in sexual abuse cases, but uh, not Kamala Harris. So Kamala Harris consistently favored Willie Brown's machine and its supporters. So all sorts of people were arrested for all sorts of heinous things, but if they were tied in with Willie Brown and his machine, she declined to prosecute. Y you had the, the most reckless behavior and she would decline to prosecute it. There was uh, Ricardo Ramirez ran a cement and concrete business called Pacific Cement. Right, one third of the public works projects in San Francisco used his company. And he was a big funder of Willie Brown's political machine, right? He consistently cut dangerous corners, threatening San Francisco public safety. He used inferior and cheaper recycled concrete on major projects like the Golden Gate Bridge, parking garages, light rail projects. These are massive projects where structural integrity was key. The half-mile stretch of the Bay Bridge's western approach, the parking garage at Golden Gate Park, wastewater treatment plant in Burlingame, the Municipal Railway's 3rd Street light rail project. Right, All these projects required solid concrete. Ramirez used inferior recycled concrete which contains recycled debris rather than hard, hard rock. It's prone to water penetration. It's more likely to crack and wear quickly. Recycled concrete is acceptable for decorative work, but for major load-bearing projects like roads and bridges, it is unsafe. And he ran this scam for years. When he was finally caught, Harris didn't seriously prosecute him, got a plea deal where he simply pled guilty to illegally storing waste oil he agreed to a year in home detention and a payment of 427000 in fines. San Francisco officials were absolutely mystified why Kamala Harris would decline to prosecute. But the guy that she might have gone after was a good friend and donor to Willie Brown. And you see this, this pattern throughout Kamala Harris's career as San Francisco District Attorney and then as California Attorney General. She would not prosecute those who were tied into her funders and her interests. So she started uh, dating Doug Emhoff. They became engaged in March 2014, and he made his career, and his law firm made, made a career in defending herbal life. So in 2015, you had attorney generals from 14 other states, including New York, investigating herbal life. Harris, who worked with these attorney generals on other issues, did not participate. Right? She declined to go after Herbalife. The FTC won a $200 million settlement against Herbalife. Kamala Harris, as California Attorney General, never investigated it. Right? Los Angeles Times noted her conspicuous failure to participate in the action. 
and Herbal Life was a client of her husband's law firm. So whenever she had uh, targets of prosecution who were tied into her husband or to the Willie Brown machine or to her donors, Kamala Harris just consistently left them off the hook. Right. That's a that's a track record. A Secret Service whistleblower is telling Senator Hawley that that guy personally directed that Secret Service agents who do threat assessment.